Greetings Magical Mavens, it's Afira here and in this video I'm just going to be taking you along with me as I do the finishing touches for transitioning from winter into spring. So it's a little bit after the spring equinox here and I've been kind of busy. It's a time of year where first of all my moon is in Aries so I do kind of get an energetic and creative boost this time of year and so I kind of get my hands in a lot of different projects. Obviously I've also been creating content for YouTube and for my podcast. And in the middle of all of that, I'm of course also preparing my home and my mindset for this new season. So I've already filmed just a lot of what I've been up to in the past couple of weeks. And then there's a couple of things that I do need to do today because I don't want it to get too far into the spring season before I've done these things that I consider to be sort of spring equinox traditions. So one of those things is going to be my ceremonious cutting of the pumpkin. So if you haven't heard me talk about this before, I have a sort of tradition that I formed in the past several years where I get a nice big healthy looking pumpkin around the autumn equinox or around Samhain slash what I like to call November's Eve. And then I try to keep it safe through the entire winter. And then I cut into it around the spring equinox. Hopefully it's still edible at that point and I like to make some sort of celebratory dish out of that. And if possible, I also like to plant some of the seeds. So lately this hasn't been something that I put a lot of stock in just because as you may know, all I have for a garden right now is my patio, which has a 10 foot awning over it and basically no south facing light. So growing squashes might not even really be possible here, but it's definitely not gonna be possible to grow the variety of pumpkin that grows into this huge crazy pumpkin that I have here. So sometimes I just plant the seeds anyway just to watch them grow a little bit even though I know they'll never really make it to maturity in this environment. It's something that I started years ago when I had a ground level garden with full sun and I just haven't been able to stop doing it because something about my little pagan heart really enjoys this concept of a full circle experience. And so harvesting the pumpkin during the fall sabbats and keeping it fresh over winter her, sort of symbolically honors our ancestors who would have had to rely on things like pumpkins to get them through the winter and then celebrating the spring sabbats with it by planting the seeds and watching it grow or even just eating the pumpkin is just kind of fun for some reason so if you have any traditions like that I would love to know there's all these traditions out here that are considered potentially historical or that lots of pagans like to do and talk about but some of the things that interest me the most are the things that we come up with on our own based on our own relationship with the seasons the elements and our own intuition and this is one of those things for me we're also just going to be doing some really simple little finishing touches like it's time for me to remove all of the winter solstice cards off of my refrigerator and just kind of spring up my kitchen and it's also time for me to actually do my spring wardrobe changeover so I did talk about this in my spring equinox bucket list video that I put out a couple of weeks ago, but the footage that you saw in that video was actually from the fall. If you noticed, I'm actually putting away the spring colored clothes and taking out the dark colored clothes in that video, but I just, that was the footage that I had to kind of illustrate my point there. But it is time for me to actually do that for the spring. So I'm gonna take you along with me for that. And I'm also just gonna show you all of the footage of everything I've been up to in the past couple of weeks. So if you caught my recent video where I went to Rising Goddess, which is a local witchy shop, to interview my friend Liz, I actually decided to go back there for their Ostara ritual, which was really fun. So I'm gonna actually show you what I did with that. I'm gonna show you the little bit of decorating that I have done since my last seasonal decorating video. You just kind of get to see how I transform my style as the season progresses. And I've also had some new creative ideas lately. So I'm gonna also take you into the office slash studio where you can kind of get some behind the scenes into some really fun new projects that I have in the Writing Witch Shop. And I'm also going to be giving you guys the much awaited garden update in this video. I'm just getting started with my gardening, but since I do have a little bit of 
historical experience, I guess you could say, with gardening in this environment, having been here for a couple of years now. I have a much better idea this year in the early spring of what I need to be doing to prepare to hopefully have the most ideal garden this year. And so I did get started very early. I'm gonna take you through the footage all the way back from when I started my first bits of garden planning in February, all the way through to where my garden is at today. So without further ado, let's make some magic. One of my personal favorite traditions is to change over my savet trees. These are just two small artificial pine trees that I keep up year round. And every six weeks or so, I update the ornaments to represent each of the eight seasons of the witch. So in this section, which I filmed the week of the spring equinox, I'm putting away the baubles, snowflakes, and icicles in exchange for early spring flowers and decorated eggs. So we actually crafted these eggs together in a recent video as a fun dollar store DIY project if you're interested. And even though the spring equinox has already passed, there's still plenty of time if you want to follow along and create something like this yourself. The beauty of living seasonally in a more slow living fashion is that you still have the three weeks after March 21st to celebrate Ostara season. In fact, I actually spent so long crafting these eggs last year during Ostara season that I didn't actually get around to hanging them up on the trees until a few weeks before Beltane, or what I like to call May's Eve around May 1st. The theme of fertility and new life is still just as relevant for the later of the two spring sabbats, so feel free to carry over your decorations for more than one season if that feels good for you. And keeping with the same theme of gradual seasonal evolution, all I'm going to do for my tablescape and my bar cart this time is remove the winter ornaments and add a few spring decor items. This worked out really well for me this season because I have had a lot on my plate lately. No pun intended. In a sense, I think I intuitively knew when I did my in bulk season decor that I was going to want more room in my schedule by this time in the season and wouldn't want to have to start decorating from scratch. Working with the Wheel of the Year is both a magical and a practical hack, as it allows us to plan ahead for the way we desire to feel in each season ahead. That early February checkpoint, the cross quarter between the winter solstice and the spring equinox, is an opportunity to start the process of shifting out of winter mode and into spring mode gradually, rather than having to change over abruptly at some point, or to have to take a whole break from seasonal celebration between, say, Yule and Ostara seasons.
Where I live, the spring equinox season can be unpredictable. Some years it's warmer and rainier with snowdrops and bulbs beginning to emerge, while other years we might still have freezing temperatures and actual snowstorms. This March has included a bit of both. The day of the ritual at Rising Goddess, it was bitter cold and all of the soil in my garden was frozen solid. And then just a couple of days later on the equinox itself, the temperature had risen quite a bit, everything had thawed out, and it was actually starting to feel a lot more like spring. In any case, I always like to spend at least a little time outdoors this time of year just to observe nature and see what signs of spring may be present, however subtle they may seem. Sometimes, even when it's hard to notice signs of plant life, the biggest sign of spring will be that I begin to hear birds chirping again. Lately, I've been pausing to listen to the birds anytime I'm able to hear them, and when I can't hear them over all the noise of the human world, I've been listening to recordings of bird sounds to help me tap into that life-giving energy of nature for springtime as I'm beginning to wake up and emerge too. That's the beauty of being a modern witch. We get to tap into nature in the most raw and direct way when we can. And when we can't, we can use technology to help give us a little bit of a boost and hold us over until our next real nature fix. This slow seasonal living approach to the Wheel of the Year, of course, allows us also plenty of room in the schedule for as much or as little magical working as feels good for us each year. The astrology was really ripe for the kinds of magical workings I've been wanting to do as the astrological new year of the spring equinox is taking place, so I've actually worked not just with the astronomical date of the spring equinox, which this year was March 21st, but also with the new moon in Aries, which happened to take place the same weekend, the full moon in Virgo, which was back on March 7th, and other more arbitrary dates throughout the month when I was either feeling particularly magical or when my witchy friends were hosting group rituals for the season. I also incorporated my daily morning and night rituals to fit in with the feeding of my bigger spells. 
So gradually over the course of March, my altar went from a tidy aesthetic setup for late winter to a very busy and blooming working altar with various talismans and workings added to it. This yellow candle, for example, and the Aries themed tarot cards were part of the Grupo Star ritual that I did with my friend Tanae Stewart in the Starlight Coven. And everything we ended up doing in her guided ritual was perfectly in alignment with the spells and intentions I already had going on my altar. It was almost uncanny how well it all fit together, actually. So the Starlight Coven is an online group, so if you're interested in joining, I invite you to check out the link below. Not sponsored, just saying. And you can also access the spell instructions in the spring edition of Starlight Magazine, which also features an article from yours truly on what gardening has taught me about manifestation. And speaking of rituals, the same thing was true of the spell I got to do in person with the staff at Rising Goddess and some of their patrons. It was a Wiccan ritual with Phoenix Coffin from the Temple of Holistic Knowledge. I don't think I had ever actually called the quarters with a group of witches before, so that was fun. And for the spell, we all raised energy and directed it into a dozen eggs before each receiving an egg to enchant with our own personal intentions. Phoenix and my friend Liz, who runs the shop, then blessed each of our eggs by each of the four elements. Part two to the spell was to go home and write a symbol of your intention on the egg and then bury it near your front door, which for me, a homebody in an apartment building, equates to burying it in a pot on my balcony garden. The idea is that we'll pass by the egg every day, and as it merges with nature, our spells will come to fruition. I decided to bury mine inside of one of my potted mums, which to be honest, I will be in contact with a lot more than the front door downstairs, which I probably wouldn't be allowed to dig up even if I wanted to, which I don't. I want this spell to be a part of my sacred space, and since the energy at the stoop of my apartment building isn't exactly what I consider sacred space for me, I've decided to do it this way, which Phoenix said was a perfectly good idea. I actually saved this task for the actual spring equinox, which happened to be a new moon this year. Because the ground was frozen a few days before when we did the first part of the ritual, and the weather report aligned perfectly with my intention to do some gardening magic on the equinox. Lately, I've been playing around more with lunar gardening and the idea that seed starting and seedling transplants are best done during the new or waxing moon. So after charging my box of seeds with my intentions at the altar, it's time to do some gardening. So for the moment, let's travel back in time to the new moon in February, when I first started to set up my grow lamp and started my first set of seeds. This year, I decided to start my gardening as early as possible, because with the growing conditions on my patio, I need to extend my growing season for as long as I can. The growing season is fairly short in my neck of the woods anyway, but with a 10-foot awning and a wall that blocks all south-facing light, I have to do everything I possibly can to give my plants the best head start they can get. I'm also still a novice gardener in general, even though I've been playing around with it for several years now. So last year, I found that I made mistakes with some of my seedlings and ended up having to start over with a lot of them later in the spring. So this time, I'm starting a lot more a lot earlier and utilizing both my grow lamp and the two west-facing windows in the back of the house to get things established and give myself and my seedlings plenty of time to experiment and get our footing ahead of time. 
I started by going through my seed collection from last year and planting some of everything. In the first moon cycle, I confirmed that a couple of my seed packets had definitely expired, and I was also able to observe other seedlings that didn't make it on the first attempt, and I assessed what may have gone wrong so I could start them again on the March new moon. As always, certain plants like my trusty beets grew for me quickly and easily, which really helped me to get in the vibe of feeling like a successful gardener, even amidst all the mishaps that happened with some of the other seedlings. I also think I may have finally figured out what I was doing wrong all last year with my arugula, which would always sprout and then die off before even growing its first set of true leaves. I'm realizing that it more so needs a consistently moist environment than consistent access to direct light. So after killing my first set yet again this year, I've resolved to plant the new seedlings in a clear plastic container and I've placed it on the sunniest windowsill rather than under the grow lamp. I have the lid placed on top of it but not closed down tight so there's a little bit of airflow but not a lot of water and moisture is able to escape. And so far, they seem to be doing way better wish me luck. I've also tested some of my tools and techniques that I've been wanting to try, and I figured out that as neat as the idea had seemed to upcycle plastic egg cartons into seed cells, it's actually really impractical and much more trouble than it's worth. I had thought this would work well as a sort of mini greenhouse, and that it would be less likely to mold than a paper carton like I had tried in previous years. But actually, some of the cells stayed too moist and some of my seedlings ended up damping off anyway. And when I tried it again without the lid, things stopped damping off, but I found that it was really difficult and really messy to try to transplant the seedlings out into larger containers. So I'm throwing in the towel on that idea from now on, and I'm just going to avoid purchasing those eggs that come in plastic containers because they're stupid and they can't even really be upcycled in the way that I wanted them to be. So I've also discovered that the trick of keeping things from getting mold or fungus is to keep an eye on them and spray them with weak peroxide if it looks like anything is amiss. This allows me to use the biodegradable upcycled containers that I would prefer to be using anyway without worrying that they'll get moldy. Another thing that used to deter me from using things like toilet paper rolls and other paper items is that in the past I wasn't really allowing myself enough room in my schedule to pay attention to my seedlings and make sure that they weren't drying out, so I wanted to keep them in plastic so that they would retain as much of their moisture as possible. But this year, I am instead just giving myself as much time to focus focus on gardening as I can. And realizing that if I want to manifest a life where gardening is a much bigger aspect of my life, then I need to start making space for that now and prioritizing it as if I really want to manifest that epic garden. Seedlings can be quite delicate and temperamental, so I'm finding that it's necessary to check on them at least twice per day to make sure they have the perfect amount of moisture and light. And this has also taught me a thing or two about patience. This month, when I finally decided to just get rid of the egg cartons, I discovered that some of the herb seeds in them that I was just about to write off as duds were actually springing to life underneath the soil surface. This is another example of one of the main points of my magazine article, that much like seedlings, there are some desires, like beet seeds for me, that will manifest quickly and easily every time, while others may take more patience than you believe you have at first. It's all part of the process of learning to work on nature's timeline. The concept of fertility for the spring sabbats used to trip me up a little when I first got started on the witchy path and before I got into gardening. A lot of what you would read about Ostara and Beltane at the time were all about the goddess and the god and the physical manifestation of giving birth to new life. As an intentionally childless adult, the typical themes of fertility didn't seem to apply to me until I actually established my own personal relationship with all of the themes of the plant penned harvest compost cycle of nature. I had to gather all the information I could about what appeared to be the universal themes of each of the sabbats, and I formulated them into journal prompts that I could respond to throughout the year to help me understand how I personally related to those themes. Now, not only do I relate to this universal cycle as a gardener, but I've also discovered how masculine and feminine energy are always at play in various ways within myself and my creative process as an artist, as a business owner, as a manifestation enthusiast, and just as a human being. 
and that's why I've based my Patreon community around these same journal prompts that continue to help me year after year, and I've also added in prompts for the moon cycles and the lunar astrology to give us an even deeper understanding of how the five elements as well as what we call masculine and feminine energy are constantly helping us to plant, tend, harvest, and compost our intentions without feeling like we have to do anything extra or do anything that doesn't really resonate with us. I think one of the reasons why last year it felt like I was having a hard time splitting my energy between gardening and focusing on my career goals was because I was keeping them separate. Society had convinced me that the concept of having a quote-unquote work-life balance meant keeping my personal hobbies in a separate room and in a separate time realm, you could say, from my work, so that it wouldn't be a distraction. Last year, this unconsciously took the physical form of starting my seedlings in the front of the house, in the living room, by the glass doors to the garden. But actually, that east-facing door with the 10-foot awning outside and the blocked south wall of the patio doesn't provide almost any real light for seedlings. And it's so far away from where I work during the day that I felt like I was having to carve out time to attend to them that didn't fit as naturally into my lifestyle as I would have liked. It actually did end up creating a distraction sometimes too, because I would find my mind, and sometimes even my feet, wandering out into the living room longing to be closer to those plants during the day. So this year I've set up my seedlings right in my sunny west-facing office, where I actually spend the majority of my time. Not only is this more practical for lighting and keeping an eye on my seedlings throughout the day, but it also serves to better integrate the energy of growth, abundance, and creative rebirth in multiple areas of my life. Being surrounded by budding nature in the room where I do the majority of my creative work is so much more inspiring, and I like to believe that the energy I'm putting into my plants can boost the success of my career and creative projects, and vice versa. Last month, I tried a business success spell from a green witchcraft book that was supposed to link my business to a specific plant. Well, those seedlings didn't end up making it, but rather than seeing that as a failure and a sign that my spell didn't work, I've instead been reminded that with my naturally non-specific manifestation style, whether or not any one specific plant survives is far less relevant than the overall energy I'm showing up with for both my gardening and my other creative goals. I know that my spells are working purely from how grateful I feel to be surrounded by seedlings in my office, regardless of the exact how of setting up my green witch spells. further anchor in this new identity I'm establishing as both a successful artist and a witch with a green thumb, I've taken the time this past month to craft a magical book for my seed collection. I decorated a photo album in the style of a grimoire or book of shadows, and I'm using it to organize and store all my seed packets. And even though it isn't a perfect prototype with its crappy plastic casings that keep tearing, and that the binding isn't quite wide enough to hold all of my seeds without the book bulging, I do love how it turned out. If this is something you would like to purchase, I invite you to leave a comment letting me know, and I'll actually use what I learned from this experiment to create a version of this for my shop that'll be durable and will have room for bulky seeds. 
Oh, and by the way, speaking of the plant tend harvest compost cycle, like I said, I love a full circle experience. So one thing I absolutely love to do when possible is grow a plant until it goes to seed and then save the seeds and plant them again the following year. You can also do this with certain grocery store vegetables. So for example, the bell peppers that I'm growing right now came right out of peppers from the grocery store. So when I have seeds that didn't come in a seed packet, I like to put them in these printable seed packets that I've created where you get to write down exactly what plant it is and what year you collected the seeds so that you know not to keep them for too long and then be sad when they don't work like five years later. So if you'd like to grab a download of these printable seed packets, I have a link for them right here. All right guys, so here is my garden update. So there's a few different things going on in here. First of all, this is my sort of kitchen garden, which makes me chuckle a little bit because I follow some gardening channels where their quote unquote kitchen garden is a garden outside that just is full of food. <laughs> but my kitchen garden is a windowsill in my kitchen at the moment. And currently I just have, these are some chives. You can do this year round. So you go to the grocery store, you get those chives that still have roots on them. I don't wanna pull one of these out to show you, but they come with the roots already on them. You can either stick them in water and put them on the windowsill, or you can actually pot them up in soil. And if you are a plant killer, you will probably not kill these plants. Like really the only way to kill these is to not water them for ages and ages. If you could, if you just keep an eye on it and make sure that the soil gets a little bit of water at least once a week or so, these things are really hard to kill. So that's just a little gardening tip for you if you are a novice. This is some herb propagations and trying to rescue part of a bamboo plant. <laughs> so, I had three bamboos and one of them kind of died on me, but I noticed that the leaf was still alive and I heard that you could propagate these. So I tried saving it. It has been in here for a few weeks now and it still looks pretty healthy, but I can't really tell if it's grown roots. Like it just, that's just the texture that it had because bamboo is stringy. So I don't know if any of those are roots or what's going on with that. So that's just an experiment. This is some rosemary. This is just rosemary from the grocery store. And I just put it in some water and it has started to grow. So I did try to do this over the winter and there just wasn't enough light for it and they ended up eventually dying. But now that it's spring and the days are getting longer, they are doing well. So this one took much longer than the other one, but I just noticed just today that there are some roots on it now. So that's exciting. This one's been growing some roots for a little while now. And eventually I'm gonna try and pot those up and hope that they survive. But in my experience, rosemary is really difficult. And I think it's because I live in a moist environment and I think rosemary prefers drier environments. Cause when I was in California, I stayed at an Airbnb where they had an entire hedge of rosemary. It was absolutely magical, but I've never seen a huge rosemary bush in my environment and I've never been able to keep a rosemary plant alive for a whole year. So that is always a, an ongoing experiment for me. Now these, again, are just some grocery store vegetables that I've put in water to see how they do. So, so far, it looks like we're probably gonna lose these outer leaves because these ones are kind of soft and flimsy and probably didn't survive the sort of transplant shock from being refrigerated to being treated like a real plant again. So I'm probably just gonna eat those this week, but the ones on the inside I'm noticing are quite healthy and quite strong in all of these, which is a good sign. That tells me that unless these end up rotting, which in order to prevent that, I'm gonna need to remove the outside leaves, but unless they end up rotting, there's a very good chance that these will grow roots and continue to grow. So that's kind of fun. Fun little tip for you guys there. 
Now these are the wild onions that I picked out of the park, out of that little wooded area in the park last spring this time. And they actually became sort of invasive in my potted garden last year. They somehow got into a lot of different pots and they were growing cr like crazy. But I have noticed that they only really grow in the spring and the fall and they go dormant during winter and the hottest part of summer. So I'm hoping that these do come back. I might have actually given these a root rot when I was watering them over the winter. I'm not sure, but we will see because it seems to be a very vigorous plant that just doesn't care too much how you treat it, kind of like that one. But we will see, and if these ones don't make it, I know where to harvest them again. And exhibit A, guys. This is another project that I'm kind of doing just for funsies. I am collecting avocado pits. I was just getting ready to do this and I realized I should show it to you. I'm not gonna show you on that one right now because I have a sink full of dirty dishes, but here's one that I did a couple of days ago. So again, this is just an experiment because I don't know if I have enough light here to really have an avocado plant succeed, but I have successfully grown one to a pretty sizable size before it eventually didn't survive. So I'm gonna try it again and I'm just gonna do it with as many avocado pits as I can find. So basically you just wanna take the ones like this preferably without cutting them up too badly. So this was a really ripe avocado and I basically didn't cut into this at all. I was just able to kind of squeeze it right out. You wanna take that and rinse it off and then let it dry. And I've discovered that if you actually just let this sit out for a few days, eventually it will shrink a little bit and this outer coating will be able to be easily peeled off. This one isn't quite ready yet, but you can peel it off and then that makes it easier for this to sort of start growing. So then you would stick toothpicks in it and put it in water so that this part is facing up and the pointed part is facing down. And you'll notice after a few days that it will start to crack open and eventually, if you're lucky, a leaf will start to grow out. So let me take you into the gardening room where I have some of these getting started after I eat my breakfast. Also, compost update. In the last video, I just emptied the winter ones of these out and I had two free buckets and they are now both full. So it's pretty warm out today. So I'm gonna go out and do some composting as well. All right, so this is the official garden where it's not just purely experimental cuttings. This is where I am starting some seeds. So in here, we have some cilantro coming up. These ones I actually planted at the new moon that was closest to February's Eve, I think. And they took exactly from the new moon to the next new moon to start showing signs of life. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Mowgli is here to hang out. Mowgli actually, when he can, he likes to lay under this like a tanning bed. <laughs> These ones I planted on last new moon as well. These are some chamomile. So I'm really excited to hopefully get some chamomile plants this year. Last year I sprouted these, but they didn't actually survive. So hopefully with my upgraded gardening skills, I can get some actual chamomile tea this year. Here is supposed to be some oregano that hasn't come up yet. Same with the thyme. The thyme and the oregano, I think, sprouted last time and then the seedlings dampened off, which is basically where due to water being inconsistent they kind of get like a fungus that kills them that is an issue that happens sometimes with starting seedlings indoors but i'm now armed with a little spray bottle full of peroxide so if i notice anything like that happening spraying it with peroxide is supposed to help get rid of that fungus and help the seedlings survive so we'll see what happens with that there should be some basil coming up in here again. Again, I had a failed basil plant last moon cycle, so we, I started it again for this one. This is the lettuce that I grew last year. I still had some seeds from that, and for some reason, they do not seem to be sprouting this year. So maybe they went bad over the winter, but I did get some new lettuce seeds that are coming up, so I'll show you those in just a second. This is bell pepper seeds that I harvested right out of a fruit. And as you can see, there is one coming up right there. 
Here we have some wildflowers starting to come up. Some more wildflowers. These are just a mix of wildflowers that I actually got from the Dollar Tree that said that they are shade loving plants. So I thought that would be really good for my garden where let's be honest here, the sunniest parts of my patio are going to be reserved for things like vegetables. So since I do want to grow some flowers this year and actually have more of a visually pleasing garden, some shade flowers should hopefully do the trick. Now these are a little bit of an experiment. So I have a few different varieties of pea seeds these ones here i did not soak in water overnight before planting them and they are not showing any signs of life and i planted them quite a few days ago now i think almost a week ago these ones i did this is a different variety and i did soak them and they are starting to come up so i'm just going to maybe take some notes on that that maybe certain things want to be soaked overnight etc etc so that this can get easier each year and here i had some tomato seeds that i thought came up more quickly last moon cycle when i tried them and they dampened off i'm not seeing them coming up just yet so hopefully that comes up soon in here we have some different varieties of lettuce that are coming up those ones are really excited to come up. There's a few, I don't know if you can see that, but there's a few coming up in there that kind of just look like they're sending out a shoot, but they don't really have any leaves yet. Now, what is this? This here is a type of onion that I grew last year that doesn't seem to be coming up. I started some seeds in the last moon cycle that didn't come up, so I've started some fresh ones and I'm still not seeing them. This over here is some marigold seeds that I am just about sure are dead. I don't know what happened to the seeds. Maybe they're just too old or something about the way that I stored them, but I've been trying to use these seeds for two years now, <laughs> multiple different attempts, and it just doesn't work. So I think I'm just gonna get rid of those. Now here is another one of my seasonal traditions, but this time I tried it instead of with a pumpkin, with an acorn squash. So I don't know if you remember, but I had this acorn squash in my decor all fall and winter. So last moon cycle on the new moon, I planted these and again, they ended up damping off. Like they actually really grew. This one I'm about to compost because this one I planted last new moon, it grew and then I transplanted it and now it seems to be dying. So I don't know if I messed with the roots a little bit too much. So I did start a new one, this new moon that is now coming up just a few days later. Here we have my trusty beets, you guys. Every gardener has that one plant that is their best friend that comes up for them no matter what. Me and beets have a very good relationship. <laughs> These two here are spinach and that container is doing much better than this one for some reason. And I have a feeling it's about to be time to actually move these to the windowsill because it might actually be getting too much consistent light under this grow lamp. Spinach likes sort of cool weather and sort of dappled light. So I'm gonna be moving those. Got my dill here coming up, that's really fun. And here of course are my avocados. So as you can see, this one here is starting to do something on the inside there. That little thing you see inside of there will send roots down into the water and it'll also send stems and leaves up. All right, back here we have some parsley that I'm waiting on, waiting on cucumbers in there. I think that sunflower seed is starting to come up, the way it's like rising out of the soil like that. This is going to hopefully be a zucchini plant, not seeing any life in there yet. Okra, again, this is my, sep my second attempt at okra. My third attempt ever, but my second attempt this year. The last ones grew and then dampened off, so I'm definitely paying close attention to that one to make sure that those stay healthy. The soybeans dampened off in the last cycle as well, so we're trying again with those. No sign of life on that one just yet. But if you look really closely, you can see some radishes coming up here. Let's see, nothing yet in the cauliflower, but I did see, I don't know if you can see that in the top right hand corner, but that is some broccoli coming up. And then this is milkweed that my sister harvested last year. She is really into saving the butterflies. And so she harvested a bunch of milkweed and I actually planted some of it the quote unquote natural way that she sort of observed the plants doing, which is where you just 
put it in the soil in the fall and then let it do its thing as spring starts. I don't know how well that's gonna work in a controlled environment here. So I did also plant some more intentionally in a pot here. So we'll see how that goes. Moving on to my west facing window. So as you may know, this is the area where I keep my house plants all winter because this is where the most sunlight comes in. This plant is doing pretty well. It's growing a new leaf here, so that's a good sign. This one has been struggling a little bit, so I'm still keeping an eye on it, but that is a relatively new leaf there that seems to be healthy. So, so I have a feeling as things brighten up, oh, here's a new one too. I have a feeling as things brighten up, this plant is gonna be much happier. Now these are just some hyacinth bulbs that my sister gave me. She did purchase them when they were flowering. And so I've done some research to understand how to keep these alive. So I've actually just watched yet another YouTube video on this that just came up in my feed after doing my research last week. But apparently you can keep these in pots but I believe I actually need to bury them a lot deeper. So I'm gonna end up transplanting these into even bigger pots because when we have them for decor, that's usually because they're forced, which is where they kind of make them bloom a little bit too early. And they do that with the bulb showing. Mine was actually just in water, but that's an aesthetic. That's not really how it's supposed to be when you plant it up. So I'm gonna end up burying that probably all the way up to there and these leaves are supposed to die back like this so that was reassuring to discover they basically are giving like they're doing photosynthesis and they're giving their power to the bulb and then the leaves will die off completely but that doesn't mean the plant is dead it just means it's dormant and it'll hopefully come up again next year so we'll see what happens with those just got my regular house plants back here as usual. The succulents are doing all right as usual. And this here is an attempt at arugula. So as for the outdoor garden, it's not much to speak of at the moment, but let's go out and have a closer look. So this right here is kind of a seedling graveyard. <laughs> These are some things that didn't make it in my first attempt at, start, at starting seeds this year. So I'm about to compost those. These are plants from last year. Those look like they were some potted herbs that definitely have not survived. Probably meant to compost these in the fall and I just ended up letting them sit there. But this is a little experiment right now. These are some fall mums and I heard that if you do leave their flowers on all winter as a sort of mulch and like mulch around it, that they might come back. And here, is my winter garden let's see all right so this is just more of those same kitchen chives that i left out all winter and as you can see even though they haven't grown they are alive and well so that's fun i also planted some garlic in here somewhere yeah i think right across this row here i planted garlic i wonder is could it be i think that is some garlic right there nice that's fun. And this side, this is some broccoli and oh my gosh, I've had this broccoli for going on a whole year now because I planted this last spring and it's just now getting some actual florets. So I'm just gonna leave this and let it do its thing. And at some point, hopefully this summer, I will have a harvest. <laughs> there were also beets in here that did not make it. I guess it got too cold for the beets. So I'm gonna leave these on for now. Same thing, just another mum. We'll see what happens with that. Dead time plant. I don't even know what this was. These are all gonna be composted in a second. This was my attempt at keeping like ivy or something or myrtles or something alive. I don't think that survived. We're gonna start ceremoniously taking down our pumpkin. Let me try and predict what's gonna happen with this. I am going to predict that there is probably no mold in here, but because of how light and sort of hollow it feels, I feel like it's probably a little bit like past its prime, like not to the point where you can't cook it up and eat it, but it's just like, it's physically much softer than you would expect a fresh pumpkin to be. But let's see, let's, let's crack this baby open. 
right, so this actually is exactly what I pictured. There is no molds in there. Is that mold? Ah, oh, shoot, I think maybe that is mold. What is that? Hmm, we're gonna have to cut this open more to see if that's mold. <laughs> But um, the seeds are definitely looking like they're probably viable. It is not mold. That's just some, just regular guts in there. So, yay. Ah, that's always so satisfying for some reason. I kept a pumpkin alive over winter. I would have survived in the olden times. Some of them have already grown. Isn't that interesting? finding myself faced with a moment where I'm not too sure what to do next. So now it's time for a little garden witch tip. Use your divination. We're just going to check in using my pendulum. So something that I've started doing that I need to actually be doing more because <laughs> I need to get more consistent with this is tapping in with my own higher self as well as the higher self of the garden space itself and or the higher selves of the plants to really see what they want. So I have a question. I'm looking at my weather report and the, the nights are still gonna definitely be below freezing, but it's looking like the daytime is not gonna be below freezing anymore. So that's definitely a sign of spring. And I'm wondering, because I need a new compost bucket, because I'm deciding that I think I'm gonna leave the one that's currently full as its own little experiment until it warms up when I can really get in there and see what's going on deep down in there. But I wanna start a new one just to take my new food scraps. So, but I need a bucket. So would it be cool if I took one of the clear containers that's currently serving as a greenhouse now that it is spring and those plants might be able to handle the outside weather. Yes. So clockwise for me is a yes. All right. Is there anything else I need to know before going ahead and doing that? No. All right. So we are confiscating one of the clear buckets. Here we go.
and there we go guys we've got an absolutely massive amount of pumpkin puree so i'm going to use some of this for probably both a savory and a sweet dish this weekend and then if there's any left i'm probably just going to pop it in the freezer so to save myself some editing time on this video, I'm not going to show you guys the rest of the process with these because it's going to look exactly like what I did with the acorn squash. But as you can see, I've rinsed these off and I've set them out to dry. And the reason for that, it's somewhat optional, but the reason for that is if there's a lot of pumpkin slime on these, first of all, it'll be harder to store because I'm not going to be planting all of these right now. I'm probably going to put a few of them in one of my printable seed packets for later on. But even if I were planting all of these now, there would be a higher chance that the slime would get some kind of like fungus or mold or something on it. Whereas you're, if you're starting with them rinsed, they, I just feel like they have a better chance of not damping off. So there's that. So the spring equinox also happens to be my brother's birthday. So let's get out of the house for a minute and I'm just going to show you some fun footage where my sister and I made this absolutely ridiculous strawberry shortcake inspired cake. Totally her idea. And we presented it to our brother who insisted that it was entirely too unhealthy and wouldn't eat it, but it was fun to do anyway. And then we took him out golfing.
Or. Yeah. Or. <laughs> not like that. Like this. Okay. Just do it. I gotta get my truth. I have to make a path. My path is gonna be like this. I'm gonna hold it like this. All right, here we go. funny part is, I've only been golfing twice with my brother, and the last one was I think almost a year ago, but funnily enough, my very first swing, I got a hole in one in the farthest flag hole thingy, but we didn't film that one, so you're just getting this crappy footage of my other attempt. As you guys know, in the fall and winter, I am eating a lot of comfort food, lots of carbs, lots of dairy, and I don't cold turkey cut myself off from those things as soon as spring comes. However, once the spring equinox comes, or sometimes even in bulk or February's Eve, I start to incorporate, if I haven't been doing so already, more fruits and vegetables. So I tend to eat a lot of vegetables anyway. As a vegetarian who appreciates Mother Earth, I do really enjoy actually just eating vegetables and I do eat them year round, but a lot of the time they take the form of things that are heavier like pumpkin dishes and stuff like that. So in the spring I start eating fruit again and full disclosure even though I am a vegetarian and I love fresh things in my diet, the reason why you've, you've noticed that I grow vegetables but I don't really grow a lot of fruit First of all, because some fruits I think are harder to grow than, than certain vegetables, but also it's because I don't really eat a lot of fruit. It's not that I dislike it in any way. It's just that for some reason, if I want something sweet, it's usually like a fruit juice or dessert. <laughs> and typically when I'm eating healthy, I'm going for the savory vegetable dishes. But to kind of get myself to appreciate fruit more and enjoy it and just get the health benefits of it, I like to mix it into refreshing drinks. So if I'm gonna be drinking iced tea or lemonade or fruit juice or even just water, I will often just throw a few berries or pieces of sliced fruit in there. They'll soak up the flavors of whatever I'm drinking and then when I get to the bottom of the cup, I will actually eat the fruit great way to trick myself into eating fruit and it is the perfect thing to start spring off with so cheers and now time for the wardrobe changeover
right guys, so I'm gonna take a little break from the time lapse and kind of show you what's going on here before moving on to the next phase. All right, so here's the current state of affairs in here. And so first of all, I will explain this, this is genius. So you know how we all have those clothes that are not dirty, but they're not fre freshly washed, so we don't wanna put them back in the drawer? That is where I keep things like this. Why are these sitting out? This is a pair of pajamas <laughs> that fits into that category. Why is that sitting out? There we go. So this, this upper thing actually does need to get tidied. There's just like decor that I haven't put up, a stack of journals. Um, we're not gonna do that today though. I thought about it, but we're already getting out of hand. Staying on task, this is a really good idea because it allows you to have slightly messy habits without it being visibly noticeable. So there we go. So this is actually just one of two containers. I'm realizing that my spring and summer t-shirts are not here, so they must be in the basement. So we're gonna do a little trip to grab those in a second. These are some shorts. I like to put those in the closet. We're gonna get to the closet in just a minute. These are spring and summer skirts. These are spring and summer jackets. Those are going to go in the closet by the door after I move some of the things that are currently in there. These are shirts and blouses for the spring and summer. That is a pile of things that is most likely going to be given away. And these are all of my dresses. So you will notice there are a few things that are still dark. Like there's a few black dresses in here, but their material is very summer. So I do allow myself to have a few black dresses for summer and a couple of shirts, for example. But for the most part, all of the dark blues and the blacks are all kind of being stuffed in here. This is also the time when I look for things like this. This is a pair of blue leggings that I really liked the way they looked. I ordered these online and when I got them, I realized they're not really that comfortable. And it was one of those things where I was like, ah, oh, they're not so uncomfortable. I guess I'll keep them and try to wear them, but I've had them for years and I have not worn them at least not more than once. So that's gonna be given away. It's just a good time to get rid of those things that don't give you joy. You know what I mean? These things I'm just gonna put away for the year. These are my dorky velour tracksuits. These, along with those jackets right there, are gonna get put in the closet by the door. These two items are dresses that I intend to turn into shirts. So I'm gonna bring these into the office slash studio. I'm gonna put them by the sewing machine and I'm going to literally put in my calendar some point in the next few weeks to hem these into shirts because if I don't write it down, I will never do it. And actually, I'm realizing I already have a bag in here of things that are going to be donated. And I started this a couple of weeks ago, actually. And some of the things in here, this is part of my glamour spell that I continuously do periodically. This is something that I actually did get a ton of wear out of over the winter, but I noticed that when I was wearing it, I didn't really feel beautiful. You know, I didn't really feel like my most magical self. And it's not that there's really anything wrong with it. It's just that it, it's ill-fitted, like it's kind of wide on me and it's not a type of material that really clings to my body in a good way or kind of emphasizes it in a good way. It kind of just bunches up. So I'm gonna give this one away and I also realized that I have another long sleeve shirt in almost this exact same color that I really do like. So I've started wearing that one and I'm going to say thank you to this one and pass it along to a new home. So it isn't always about things that you never get wear out of. It's also about just choosing to upgrade, choosing to move on to something and create space for something that is really gonna make you feel good. Same thing with this one. Now this bag here is the pile of shame. It wasn't originally shameful, but at this point it is shameful and it needs to be removed. So I think I put this together, geez, maybe even about a year ago. Dang, bruh. I think I actually put this basket together about a year ago and it's basically things that I'm unsure about. So things that I think I like, but they maybe don't get a lot of wear in my wardrobe and I was gonna give them one last chance by putting them in this container 
and choosing to reach for them and to style them and to see how I would actually wear them. And I'm realizing that I've basically not done that. And as I'm looking through it now <laughs> with fresh eyes, I am realizing that probably 90% of the things in here are either not me anymore or they're things that were that I purchased that were really cheap and I didn't feel like sending them back and I hoped that maybe I would get more use out of them but maybe something about the way the material felt or the way it fit just wasn't really right and I just haven't reached for it. And this is exactly the kind of stuff that we need to release and create space for either something new or just clear fresh energy right just minimizing i'm not a minimalist and i'm i don't have a goal of being a minimalist i'm a maximalist but it has to be things that i really love and most of this stuff or basically all of it i think i'm gonna take this one out because i do kind of like that one for spring this is one of those things that i've had for years and i literally years and years and years and i like the way it looks but i don't like the way it feels it's not a very nice material i don't need that in my life so we're gonna let all of this stuff be donated to a new home also friends just to quickly clarify because environmentalism is is important to me so i just wanted to clarify not all of these things that i said like i bought it and then didn't wear it it's not all brand new stuff like most of it is stuff that i've actually purchased from a thrift store secondhand anyway this is like a Wednesday Adams dress that I got at the thrift store years ago thinking it was a cool idea. Never wore it and I'm just going to donate it back to the same thrift store. So it's not like I'm like buying all this newly manufactured stuff. A lot of the time I'm trying to give something a second life or I do give something a second life and then I just kind of outgrow it style wise. Like this I got from the thrift store years ago. Wore it a few times. It's all right, but it's just not me anymore. Most of the stuff. There are a few things in here that were purchased new that I basically never wore. Like this is this weird oversized sweater dress thing. Literally it was one of those things where I was placing an order and in order to get free shipping, I had to spend three more dollars and that was on sale for $3. So I bought it and I did the stupid fast fashion thing just for like that one thing. So that does happen every once in a while or it has happened every once in a while. I hope it doesn't anymore. But yeah, just to clarify, this is not like a bunch of brand new stuff. The vast majority of it, it's a second or third time of someone owning it and using it. So I'm just continuing to recycle for the most part. All right, enough procrastinating. I need to go down to the basement. I'm gonna start some laundry while I'm down there and I'm also going to see what other clothing is down there. Also, there were some things in there that there was nothing necessarily wrong with them, but I just realized I was reaching for other similar items and they weren't getting any love. I think my intention wasn't necessarily to get rid of all of those things if I didn't wear them. So some of these things I am gonna give a second chance. I just forgot that like I put it there because I intended to wear it more and then I didn't. So the skirt, in that skirt or some of those things, for example. Turns out there wasn't another thing of clothing. There was just my lovely summer hats, my sun hats, but I just remembered what I'm looking for is actually just in the coat closet. Cause last year I realized that I don't really like having my clothes in that dirty spider filled basement. So this is just my last little bit of winter decor. I'm gonna bring that down to the basement when I go to switch my laundry over. All right, so the truth is I'm not gonna be getting rid of most of this stuff right now because it is still cold. I'm gonna keep my white jacket out. This one, this is really a special occasion coat. That's another thing that I'm, I'm keeping put away this year as occasion wear. I have just a couple of occasion wear things that I don't reach for most of the time. I'm gonna leave those in containers for now. I'm really excited to start wearing this again, but it's not even warm enough for that yet. This one, this just dark colored pea coat, I think I'm gonna put that in a container. This dark blue 
blazer. I want to wear things like this more often and I rarely do, but I'm gonna keep it anyway. I'm just gonna put it away for the season. That's kind of more when I get dark academia for the fall. This one, this is, I'm getting the fall vibes for this one too. I'm gonna put that away. Very excited to start wearing this again, my purple denim jacket for spring. This I kind of consider occasion wear, but I'm gonna leave it out for the spring, see if I get any use out of that. Pleather jacket, that can be put away for fall. This is something that I've, I got from the thrift store ages and ages ago. I love the idea of it, I never wear it. I'm gonna put this in the lose the use it or lose it pile, which is gonna be very small this year. But if I don't wear these and style these, and I'm gonna give myself an even shorter amount of time. If I don't style this by the summer solstice, I'm gonna give it away. That's gonna be the rule. I feel like this is just something that's good to have. You never know when you'll need a blazer. Oh, I have two leather-like jackets. I might choose between the two of them. This one is older. This is more my sort of grunge goth days and I never really reach for things like this anymore. And even though it feels like giving away a part of my soul, I have a leatherette jacket now that is much more like sophisticated and I might have to, might have to give this one up even though we've had many great times. Hmm. I put this one away for the season, possibly giving that away. Yeah, I might. This is another one of those things. Why do I have so many blazers? I love the idea of blazers, like dark academia style. Oh my gosh, there's another one. This one's been around for ages. I just rarely reach for them. Honestly, the thing that I'm most excited for right now in my life is just casual dresses. Like when I pulled out my spring summer casual dresses that is what made me feel excited because that is what i wear now but i'm gonna try and branch out a little bit this year all right so under here got all my winter shoes out too i'm gonna be putting some of those away but we need to get back there because that is where some more spring summer clothing is So I have decided to keep most of the jackets for now. It's just one of those things where like, I live in an environment where there's a lot of different times when you might need some kind of a jacket and I like to have a variety. So some of these are thrifted, vintage, others of them I've purchased new, actually just two of these I've purchased new, but I just feel like they, it's not about whether or not they bring me joy all the time as much as like, this brings me joy at a certain time of the year when it's freaking cold and I want something that shapes like a dress that makes me feel magical, even though it's freaking freezing. Like this hasn't really brought me a lot of joy yet, but it is a navy blue blazer. And when I get in the mood to make up a navy blue blazer outfit, which I love the idea of, but rarely do, I'm gonna want this to be handy. So I'm gonna hold on to that because it will bring me joy when I'm in the mood for it and that is totally okay. That is one of my maximalist values. It's like, it doesn't have to be bringing me joy 24 seven, but it does need to be bringing me joy at some point. And so this, for example, this brought me joy for my late 20s into probably age 30, but I just, I'm not a bomber jacket girl anymore. And I have something to replace this with that's more of my style. So I'm gonna give that away. This brought me joy for years. This one was thrifted and I still like it, but I have other things that are similar to it now that are just something that's fresher and newer and more something to play with. So I'm gonna say thank you to these and let them go. That feels like spring to me <laughs> because even though I live in an environment where I still am gonna be wearing one of the same coats that I wore in the dead of winter for a little while longer, first of all, there's just so much more room in here because all those bulky coats don't all need to be in here anymore. And I also just get to look at these beautiful colors when I'm getting ready to leave the house and decide what color fairy I want to be that day. And even though it's still lots of long sleeves and layers for right now, that is okay. These shoes. 
I like how fairy-like these shoes are. And I've had them for years. Again, they were secondhand. I think these were real leather, which I don't ever purchase new, but, well, actually I did. I do, I do own a pair of new leather gloves, guys. I just live in an environment where my hands need to not fall off. So there's that, but I typically never buy leather. But since they were real leather, thrifted they lasted for a really long time but they are a little tiny bit too small they've always been a tiny bit too small so i don't reach for these when there's a more comfortable option these are covered in salt not because i wore them this year but because my winter boots were sitting on top of them because there's not much room in here so i think i am going to make the executive decision to give these ones away maybe some other fairy out there with slightly smaller feet and vintage taste will get more use out of these than i have in the past couple of years there we go. That's what we're looking for. was quite a job. It kind of took me all late afternoon into it's like 9 p.m. now, especially with doing laundry and like folding that and everything in the meantime. I am exhausted, but let's do a final walkthrough. So here is the next level of the hall closet. So I have kind of just put really wintry and very folly shoes farther back on top of my fall and winter clothes back there. A lot of the things that I'm bringing to the forefront now are like not sandals and stuff. Sandals are still shoved in there, so they'll be ready to be pulled out when the time comes. But as you can see, I just changed out my winter colored winter hats for spring colored winter hats because there's still going to be at least a few more. What is Mowgli talking about? There's still a... F I think he's going to barf. And we're back. I managed to rescue the carpet from my cat puking on it by shoving something directly in front of him to catch it. Uh, moving on. <laughs> yeah, so it's still, there's still going to be a little bit of time when it's quite cold. So I do sometimes just switch out the colors of like the exact same kind of hats that I would wear in winter. And that's how I bring on spring. So these are just the hiking boots that my siblings got me for my birthday recently. Looking forward to using those. 
those are all strappy sandals up there that we're not ready for. And some of them are actually occasion wear. So those are things that very rarely get used, but they're just kind of hanging out there until some time when I have a reason to look decent. And that's that closet. This is my donation section. This was like my only really like quote unquote nice pair of shoes that I had in my late 20s. But as you can see, my cat has used them as a scratching post a few different times. I added feathers to this when that feathery shoe trend was a thing. And first of all, I didn't do a great job. And second of all, they're now beat up. So it's very obvious that I didn't do a great job. So I'm gonna get rid of those. This bag is actually the only like big duffel type bag that I have, but I bought it when I was getting ready to go on a trip and it was all that they had at the TJ Maxx near me years ago. And I honestly never really liked it that much. And so even though I don't have something to replace it with just yet, I am going to make the higher self decision of giving this away to create space for something that I actually like. And I, after the pandemic, I really don't use it that much. I used to use it for like overnight trips, hanging out with friends that I really don't hang out with anymore. And I rarely stay away from home. And if I do, I'm like bringing a suitcase. So we don't need that. If you've been watching the videos, you know that that has been waiting to get donated for like a month now. These are some plant bottoms, drip, drip trays that I don't need anymore. I'm gonna donate those. All of this and that bag are all of the clothes that I'm gonna be donating. Got these shoes here. And I'm also donating this container because it's big, it's awkwardly shaped, and it doesn't fit anywhere. And it was like a hand-me-down from someone. So that's gonna go too. Seems like a lot, but I guess it's a lot. And here is the closet. So the method to my madness here, with it being a very small closet and kind of a lot of clothes, these are all my shorts. These are all of the skirts that are not pleated. <laughs> these are costume things, like all my seasonal headbands are up there that you'll see in my seasonal videos. These are my childhood stuffed animals and one that my partner got me when we first met. I used to have them on display in here, but I've kind of switched to a different theme, so they're just kind of hiding out for now. Really good hat, guys. If you need to store a bunch of clothes in a small closet, save these things off of like cat food containers and use them to stack your hangers. So this is way more clothing than you would think would be able to fit in a closet this size, but I have made it work. So method to my madness here is like, Clearly I have a uniform, guys. Like I <laughs> I have several different pleated or plaid mini skirts in just my favorite colors. So like several different types of plaid and not plaid for lavender, several different kinds for blue. There is a different one in here. Um, this sort of like Scottish pattern that I really like. I own very little brown, but these are the brown, the two brown skirts that I might wear in the summertime. There's a black and white one and a few gray ones in here. Most of the black stuff has been put away. There are some black things still out. So this one is a blouse, for example, but the material is very summery. And yeah, everything is stacked. So like this is white blouses second thing of like longer sleeve white blouses one purple there should be two purple dresses these two should be together on the same hanger hold on a minute here try to do this with one hand but yeah that's how that works cat food cans guys very useful Again, these are black summer dresses. So yeah, I guess my thing with black is like, I really only wear black in the summer if it's like a sundress. That kind of is the the rule, but that's kind of like how I break the rule there a little bit. It's not really a rule, it's a guideline. But yeah, there's way more dresses in here now. In the winter there was, I was literally wearing this dress over and over again, cause it's like my most comfortable long sleeve dress. But the spring and summer is when I'm just basically going to be living in dresses. So I'm really excited for that. And down here are all my sweaters and stuff that I've just put away. So this dresser top is not like set up. I'm going to actually spend a day. I put it literally in my calendar 
because I've been putting it off forever, but I have scheduled a day to actually redecorate this whole area. I'm gonna put some art on that wall, make this look a lot nicer, but for spring summer, there doesn't need to be like a big stack of bulky sweaters there, but I do think it's kind of nice to just switch out a, a short stack of sweaters for spring collars. Those also kind of didn't fit in here. So in here, these are a combination of long sleeve shirts and lightweight cardigans that are in my spring colors. And then in here are the heavier, more winter-like sweaters that are in spring colors. Cause like I said, for the next few weeks, maybe even month, I'm probably still gonna need these. So that's what that's there for. These are a combination of t-shirts and slightly more dressy t-shirts, basically. Like these things are like a cross between a t-shirt and a blouse, I guess you could say. It's very stuffed for spring summer because I really don't wear t-shirts in the winter. There's like a lot less stuff in there during the winter. And then in here are polo shirts and waistcoats. Down here are shorts and leggings and like the literally one or two pairs of structured pants that I own. Not really a structured pants kind of guy, but I basically just pulled out all of the like comfy shorts. Like, so the shorts that were in the closet are like structured shorts. These are the like chilling out at home kind of shorts. There's some sweatpants in here. And the only black things are still just my regular yoga pants because I can't live without those during any season. That's just how it is. And this pile right here are just things that I'm either considering giving away or things that I wanna try on or like try styling before deciding if I wanna give it away. I got this for my birthday several years ago and I loved the style of it, but it's just not comfortable. Like I like things that are either loose or flowy or stretchy and this is none of those things. So that's off to a better home. But yeah, these are just some some things that I need to kind of look over and possibly give away. So if you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for being here. This was a lot of fun to make and I have been getting a lot of positive feedback from the vlog style content for the seasons. So if you actually enjoyed this and you're okay with the fact that it was this long, please leave me a comment and let me know because I'm not too sure what I'm doing here. But if you did really enjoy this video, then I also invite you to check out this one right here where I'm basically doing the same thing, but for the earlier season. It still has a lot of good tips in it for spring since it's that sort of pre-spring sabbat. I will see you there. Thank you so much and blessed be.